November 1910, Eugene Ely took off from a modified Navy cruiser on the Virginia coast flying a Glenn Curtis airplane. Two months later, Ely landed on a different ship in San Francisco Bay. Naval aviation was born. Training soon moved from Virginia to Pensacola, Florida, which is the cradle of naval aviation. Every naval and marine aviator to this day traces his or her start in flying to Pensacola. Every Navy aircraft ever flown is housed in the Naval Air Museum at NAS Pensacola. If you love airplanes, especially Navy airplanes, you will love visiting this incredible museum and its National Flight Academy for 7th to 12th graders on Fetterman Way at the museum. The Navy's first ace was Naval Aviator No. 85, David Ingalls, in 1918. Flying a British Sopwith Camel for the RAF, he shot down five German airplanes in six weeks. Plane design and production proceeded unstopped for the next 20 years, and by World War II, naval aviation had become a power to defend our way of life, particularly in the Pacific Theater, after the surprise Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, December 7, 1941. Just four months later, in April 1942, Jimmy Doolittle led 16 Army Air Corps B-25 bombers from the Navy carrier Hornet in a daring raid. They accurately and successfully bombed targets in Japan that sent a strong message to the Japanese leadership. The message? You made a huge mistake bombing America. Navy planes dominated in the Pacific War. Fighters, the Grumman Cat series, the Wildcat, the Bearcat, the Tiger Cat, and the Hellcat. Hellcat pilots shot down over 5,000 Japanese airplanes in the Pacific. The late Alex Vashu, the Navy's fourth ranking ace, said that he loved his Hellcat so much that if it could cook, he'd marry it. And there were dive bombers, the Douglas SBD Dauntless, that was a key in destroying Japanese aircraft carriers at the Battle of Midway. And the Hell Diver, that replaced the Dauntless. There were PBYs, and the Kingfisher spotter and rescue planes, and of course, the 400 mile per hour Corsair. The Corsair was one of the most successful fighter planes of World War II and very effective later in the Korean War. Most of its fighting in World War II was in the Pacific Theater against the Japanese. The Navy flew the Corsair from aircraft carriers, the Marines from island airfields. It was an air-to-air -air fighter, it was a ground attack aircraft and escorted on bomber missions, protecting them from Japanese fighters. It was the first American plane to outperform the Japanese Zero. It could outclimb, outrun, and with its firepower, outgun any prop driven enemy aircraft. And with its solid build, it could take severe punishment, and it was hard to bring down. Allied troops called it the Angel of Okinawa and the Sweetheart of the Marianas after the Mariana Islands campaign. The Japanese called it Whistling Death because of a distinctive sound 
the Corsair made at high speeds. Corsairs were especially successful at intercepting and shooting down thousands of Japanese kamikaze planes before they could reach Allied ships. Corsairs dropped 70% of all bombs dropped by fighters in World War II, flying more than 64,000 sorties, and had over 2,100 air victories, losing only 189 aircraft in combat. The plane could be very difficult to fly, and sadly, nearly 700 Corsairs were lost in non-combat accidents. A popular TV series, Black Sheep Squadron, popularized the Corsair and the Marine Squadron Commander, Pappy Boyington. Four aviators received the Medal of Honor for their Corsair accomplishments. Marine Major Gregory Pappy Boyington, Marine First Lieutenant Robert Henson, Navy Lieutenant Junior Grade Tom Hudner, and Marine Lieutenant Ken Walsh. Afternoon, everybody. I'm David Hartman. It's nice to be with you today, and thank you. Thank you. And please welcome Jim Tobel, who owns this airplane. Thank you. Jim, when we just wound up the video talking about four Medal of Honor recipients from World War II. With your experience and your entire lifetime with this airplane, when you see and think about them, what goes through your mind and through your heart when you see them and think about what they did? You know, just the valor, valor alone. I mean, these are young guys thrown into combat, flying a fighter, and you're out, it's kill or be killed. And you're out there doing the best you possibly can, and you have all these elements that are against you, and then you have a machine like this that makes you into a positive impact. Because so, it's the tool. It is truly a tool. So this airplane, or different designs of the airplane, had a multi-year life. Going back to that period at the tail end of World War II, what was that airplane capable of doing, and then how did it progress out of that before we got to Korea? Well, this aircraft obviously served in the Pacific Theater. And you go backwards, and you had the Wildcat, which, you know, was great in its time, but it was a little um, uh, lesser of an aircraft than our adversaries. So then the Hellcat came out, and so on and so forth. Each one, the Japanese had a, a little bit better aircraft. So the Corsair was designed based upon all this knowledge that we learned that we had to design something to attack the Zero. So this aircraft used the largest engine and propeller combination at the time, and Chance Vought built the, air the airframe around the power plant and propeller. So then moving on to Korea, so what happened in the design of the airplane when you got to Korea? Well, they it's learned. It's now like six, five, six years later. Yes, they learned a lot from the Dash 1 variations. Uh, Goodyear, they couldn't produce them enough, so they uh, subcontracted to Goodyear. Goodyear and Chance Fought were uh, supplying aircraft concurrently. So they learned a lot of uh, enhancements, such as adding the fourth blade. Instead of having a three blade, they put floors inside the uh, the aircraft. The wings were now armament where they could put eight five-inch HVR rockets. And uh, the Dash 4 was a learning curve from all the other predecessors as to a more enhanced, higher-altitude aircraft. We just heard those names, Pappy Boyington. Did you ever meet Pappy Boyington? You know, that's so ironic. I'm old. 
and so in, back in the early 80s, I would come out here and buy parts at Banair. They had their little uh, shop and uh, having a T6 you need, seal kits or whatever. So I would buy my parts and there's Pappy Boynton with his wife selling the book. And I'd you know go over and talk with him, speak with him, not knowing one day I would actually be flying a Corsair. What about Tom Hudner? Tom Hudner, I was very blessed to have the opportunity. We presented wow. to a young uh, a recipient a scholarship, and Tom asked asked that uh, I join him in this presentation over at the Eagle Hangar. And what an amazing individual Tom Hudner was. So, and, and explain what happened to him in Korea, just so we get an idea. Well, they were flying in Korea in Corsairs, and uh, his wingman, one of the um, pilots, Jesse Brown, I believe his name was, okay. he was the first black fighter pilot that I believe that we had in that Corsair era, and he had engine trouble, and he landed the aircraft behind enemy lines. It's up in North Korea. Yes, in North Korea during the Korea War. And then Tom would circle and uh, willing to sacrifice his aircraft to help his wingman that was, he didn't know if he was alive or, you know, what the situation was. And so he um, ended up doing the best he could under the, the circumstances yeah. with his airplane. And Brown, your lifetime is tied up with this airplane. When did you start flying? Wow. I started flying when I was nine years old. Dad had a Stenson 108. Nine? And nine years old, and I would sit there, and he taught me how to fly. And that's a big rudder, you know. That was a little bit of a challenge. But I didn't have a phone book. I actually was able to sit on a pillow. But, uh, yeah, and so from that far, that point forward, my father was a pilot. Tell me about so, your dad. Well, my dad uh, served in the Marine Corps, and I was born at Cherry Point. And uh, he was in VMF 231, which is now VMA 231. And uh, I was slated to fly Harriers in his former squadron. And the Hawaiian life came and ailing family business, Marine Corps. And so I knew where I had to go. And so I, I did not go down that path. But aviation has always been in my blood. And, and so my dad and I worked together as well with the business. And uh, so we started to uh, work on Warbirds. So our first one was an SNJ. We bought it. We restored it. We flew it. And uh, then we had... Did you actually physically do the restorations? Physically, yes. My dad and I both wow. did all the work. We restored them, flew them, repaired them, and paid the bills, swept the floor, and kept them clean. And where did this airplane come from? Where where'd did you get this airplane? Well, we looked at five different projects, and so we selected this particular model after looking at, I think, about four or five. We bought it in 1981 in three truckloads of parts. And it took us 10 years to build it, got it flying in 1991, and in 1992 was the first air show, and that was in Titusville, Florida in 1992. And how did that go? Oh, elated. My father was just elated. I mean, you spend 10 years of your life building something that you'd work weeks and weeks and weeks, and you wonder, what progress did we make? Because you just keep working. And then finally, it all comes together. How much of that is passion and how much of it is obsession? Uh, in our case, 98% was passion. <laughs> 2% was obsession. So we, he started flying it. Yes. Did you start flying it then too? I, I did a few years later. Dad didn't want to work out all the bings and the bangs and you know get the airplane kind of dialed in, so to speak. So a couple years later, then I jumped into it. I think it was about 93 94, right. and then I started to fly the aircraft. So what happened with him flying the airplane? Um, you mean initially? Yeah, no, later. Oh, um, in 2002, yeah. uh, my father, we were at an air show, the last air show of the season, which is in Columbia, South Carolina, and uh, he developed engine trouble in the aircraft and uh, was trying to get back to the... Well, let me back it up. The reason why we were there is my dad always went over to the VA, and he noticed that the VA um, patients couldn't make it to the airport for the air show. So he would call them up and say, hey, wheel all the guys out in the front yard. I'm going to bring the Corsair over and give them their own little air show. So he started going, and I would go, and, and 
and other pilots are going, hey, wh where are you going? My dad said, well, we're going over the VA and give them a little air show themselves. They said, well, we want to go with you. So it turned out that we had more. Each year, it was more and more aircraft. Well, we had a B-25. We had T-6s, Corsairs, Mustangs, all heading over to the VA. And so we were rendezvousing. We were all getting together. And that's when my dad had engine troubles. So he was low and slow. And in a Corsair, uh, you know, altitude, airspeed is your friend. So he had very limited places to land going low and slow. Saw a neighborhood, and he was just coming in to land in the neighborhood, very dicey with houses and such. And so I was on his wing. I was flying an SNJ. He peeled over, and he just landed ever so gently in the tops of the trees. Little did we know the trees were that big around. So I had lost my father and the aircraft in 2002. You know, at the risk of going out down this road, when you're so deeply entwined with your dad in every way, and you're flying on his wing and see what happened, what happened with you after that accident when you lost your dad? That's interesting. What, what went on? Well, that's a very interesting question because I was in the SNJ and I would fly off my dad's wing. And I had my oldest son in my back seat and my other son was in the B-25. And my mother was on the ground at the time. So we basically had the entire family there. And when I saw the accident, I obviously I circled, waiting for him to get out. And uh, fire ensued. And uh, now... I could see what the situation was. I didn't see him come out. I didn't know what it was. But now I have my son in the back seat, so I need to land. Got my game face on, picked up everything I had to pick up, get back to the airport. Of course, there's a 90-degree crosswind. And uh, landed the airplane, did what I needed to do, and then it was tough. It was very difficult. So how do you start picking up pieces after something like that happens? Well, Not only my, for the airplane... But for you. Well, my dad. My dad, we worked together. We played together. You know, worked hard, played hard. And he was my best friend. You know, it was one of those. So it was very difficult. And about six years later, I decided I want to rebuild the airplane. Six years. Six years it took me to kind of just digest the whole situation. And, um, you know, not to digress too much, oh, but digress. after the accident, I got in the SNJ and went to Tyndall Air Force Base in March of the following year. So it was my first air show after my dad had the accident. And I was sitting there eating breakfast, and there was a Delta pilot and, you know, various pilots. And we all go to the airfield, and he was racing the jet truck. And somehow there was a miscommunication. The jet truck took off, and he thought it was a taunting pass. He saw he messed up pulled it hard, stalled it, and impacted the ground. So I just sat there and I just walked up and down the flight line because this is the second time in a very short period of time and really questioned myself and what I just saw. But again, I pulled within, persevered, rationalized what happened, and keep moving forward. So it took six years to get over that and uh, had the opportunity to buy a lot of parts and uh, facilitate the restoration. So I started to work on it, and again, my dad and I did the work. So how beat up was the? the it was wreck? pretty. It was pretty. It was pretty beat up, but there was I could salvage it, and so yeah. I did that. And uh, it was going to take. I had a friend of mine, uh, Bill Clares at Westpac, and he was good friends of my dad. And he said, "Jim, I hear you're going to restore the airplane." I said, "Yep." He says, "It's going to take you about eight years, ten years," and I said, "Yeah." And he said, you'll be 60 what? And I said, that's, that's just not fair. That's not nice. <laughs> yeah, right. He said, tell you what, bring it to me. I know what this airplane means to you. I'll have you fly in in two years. Wow. And I thought about that, and I shipped everything out to Westpac. Two years, he had this bird back in the air. So 2011 is when this aircraft came back out, and I was, went to the same Tyco Air Show. Well, the first time this airplane came out, which is the same time in 1992 uh, on its initial restoration. So the aircraft represents my dad and myself, and it's just, it's right there. <laughs> so it's not just, a, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And you know what? 
a little tidbit here. I'm going to digress on oh, you. Digress. And I mean. so when I'm restoring it, it's coming down to the paint job. Well, what is respectful? Should my dad be above me? Should he be below me? Where, where on the name in the cockpit should I put him? Uh, and I thought, and th I didn't know what to do. I always want to be respectful. One night I woke up and I thought, wait a minute, he's with me. So I put a slash. So if you look at the airplane, you'll see my name slash my dad's name. So he's always with me when I fly this airplane. Oh, boy. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> tidbit. Just a little tidbit. Yeah, a little tidbit. A little tidbit. <laughs> so when you fly this airplane in various shows and sorts, what do you do? What, what goes on? Well, I perform an aerobatic demonstration. I want to show what the aircraft is capable of. So I'll do a full aerobatics display. Um, a lot of times you won't see a full Cuban because it's, it's difficult. You have to have a lot of energy to do one side of the Cuban and come into the second half of the Cuban. So that's my first entry is the full Cuban, and then I go into a roll series with the aircraft and really... Let people see and hear and feel what uh, 2,000 plus horsepower sounds and looks like up there. So what else do you do air show wise besides your, your solo? Uh, then I part of a, a, um, an act, if you will, called Class of 45. And a friend of mine has a Mustang and it's a 1945 build. This is a 1945 manufacturer. So we said, hey, we have two headline aircraft Let's do something together. And he performs an incredible aerobatic demonstration in a P-51. I do a full demonstration in the Corsair. And then when we're finished, we come together and we fly formation and aerobatics in, with the Corsair and the Mustang. And that's called Class 45. And you flew this last night? I did. We were uh, invited to fly the Twilight, just preemptive to the night flight. So there's supposed to be a little light up there. And yes, we, uh, we perform two initial maneuvers, not our full act, because we're limited in time, and then the full class of 45. And how did it go, Jim? Went really Last good night. to about halfway point. And uh, we're turning in formation, we're coming at the crowd, and we're just about to roll up in the belly. And my, I fly very, fly very close formation to the Mustang, so my focal is 100% on the aircraft. And all of a sudden, I saw something pass me very quickly off the right wing, and I felt a thump. And I looked, and I went, birds. We went through birds. And I felt a thump. Everything felt normal. I looked at the wings. I couldn't see anything. I called it out. Uh, at this point, I have a decision. Either knock it off, stop everything, land the airplane, or continue. So I let my lead know that I had a bird strike, but everything seems to be normal. Let's continue. So the plane took it. The plane took it and kept on flying, and then we continued. We did some more aerobatics, and I landed the aircraft, and... There was nothing unusual, no vibration, no nothing, until I shut the engine off, got out and looked to see what and, happened. And what did you see? I saw that hole in the wing, right where that black tape is. I don't know if you can see point that. Out, point it out. <laughs> you covered this up pretty, pretty well. Well, we had to go into surgery last night, <laughs> lift the wing, and, and remove some things and items that were stuck right in. This is the gun camera. So there's a big void where the wing folds, and a gun camera goes in there. I just happened to not have the camera inside there. So it, it, the, the large bird went through the glass, through the lens of the camera, into the void, and just... Shattered everything. Yeah, shattered button. So he did that. Also, another one, I think, hit right here and dented the leading edge as well. So what are you going to do now with this? Well, I will, right now, it's, it's uh, basically unairworthy. And so I will take it over to the Weeks hangar, and I'll create a patch to go over top of this with aluminum. Metal. metal, metal aluminum, and I'll rivet it in place. And this will be a temporary patch to get me through to the winter time where we'll do the proper um, fix. Right. And what, uh, but glad that went. And well, so, well, yes, okay. it, bird strikes can be. Yeah. Uh, so, but you're flying again on Saturday? I am, yes. We're and flying during flying the day. In? Yeah. What are you flying on Saturday? Um, well, on Saturday, I'll be flying Class 45. And then on Sunday, I'll be flying, I'm a Navy legacy pilot. 
and I'll be what flying. Is that? What does that mean? It means I'm the, you know, the Air Force has the heritage where they fly with the P-51s. Well, the Navy has a Navy legacy side where we'll fly with the Super, super Hornets or the Rhinos, various naval aircraft, and I'll be flying what they, they call the Growler. The Growler is an F-18 G model, which is more electronic warfare, right. and I'll be flying with him on Sunday. <laughs> representing the Navy. <laughs> Go back. And I'm the old guy. They're the new guy. Yeah. yeah. Um, Go back and talk about some of these pilots and the legacy of the men who flew this airplane beginning in World War II through Korea. Did they fly in Vietnam at all? Um, I don't think that they did. I think I via, by Vietnam you had the Sky Raiders and some of the other heavier lifters, yeah. which then made this more obsolete, and the Sky Raider was more purpose-oriented, which we call them a flying dump truck, because they could just put so much ordnance underneath, equaling the weight of the aircraft, where the Corsair was more limited in the amount of ammunition and stores and right. uh, items to haul. But when you talk with, like today, with people, what do you say about the legacy of the, the guys who flew these airplanes? And many of them, of course, as we have heard, gave up their lives flying this airplane. You know, it's amazing. The aircraft was uh, World War II based, and they came out with challenges. The initial Corsair could not make a good carrier landing, it would bounce. So they stricken all the Corsairs from carrier operations. So they took the Corsairs and put them in the Pacific Islands. And then you had Pappy Boynton flying the aircraft from the land strips until uh, Chance Fog could develop a way so the struts wouldn't bounce the aircraft on the carrier. So in that time frame, they developed it, they proved it, and then the, car then the Corsairs were allowed to come back to the carriers. What's the gull wing? How did that come about? Why was it necessary? Well, that's interesting because you, they were started with the largest engine and propeller combination at the time. So Chance Vaught had to build the airframe around the, that power plant. And so when they did that, they put a straight wing across. Now, if you can visualize the straight wing, the gear would be so long, there's no way it could actually um, operate effectively on a carrier. It's just too long, it would break and snap and not have the, the you know, rigidity to handle it. So the designers, the engineers said, well, we'll just gull the wing lessen the length of the gear, therefore we have a carrier operation that won't have any adverse effect. Therefore, hence the gull wing design. So how did that affect the, op the, the way the airplane flew? You know, that's another interesting question. They say, well, does it give you any better aerodynamics? Does the plane, the plane doesn't even know it. There really isn't any added benefit in the flying aspect of the airplane. It just looks really cool. So <laughs> your family went through all of this with you. Describe what this was like for them. In terms of? Oh, your dad and all of that. Well, they knew this was our passion. And we loved aviation. We loved the warbirds. We flew in the business. So I did corporate flying. My dad did corporate flying. And this was a hobby. And we enjoyed our hobby. And, th and that's where the passion comes through. And, uh, you know, you work hard. It allows you to play hard. Thank you so much, Jim. Appreciate it. Everything that you have shared with us today, especially about your family and uh, your life's journey with your family, we appreciate it. Well, thank you. And please welcome uh, Sam Bass, who's got 50 years of, of, of uh, great luck. flying. Luck, luck, luck. Uh, yeah, luck, 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 <laughs> right. But... Uh, uh, accident free flying and uh, Sam's got over 35,000 hours himself in the cockpit and he's our airplane guy Sam yeah, we're going to spend a little bit of time here with Jim if he'll he'll let us and absolutely come up and you know, stand by the airplane and let, let you point out some little things yeah, just way. give us uh, just a general description of the Corsair we've already covered the inverted gull wing how much horsepower has this airplane got well mine's a little different I, I actually boosted mine a little bit higher I'm, I'm running 2600 horsepower but typically it should be 21 2200 2200 was normal 2200 was normal. okay was I'm that, ab that I'm was abnormal it, was, was that that was all all variants of it 
It was all variants, military variants. Right, yes. I understand. How about the uh, armament on the airplane? Armament. There was, there was uh, probably six, different ones. Yeah, there were different variations. This particular aircraft, you can see the gun ports had six 50 caliber machine guns and uh, 2,400 rounds of ammunition. The other variation was two 20 millimeters on each wing. And I'm um, not sure the total capacity, but it was 20 millimeter. They were real big. Well, how about underwing ordnance? Did it carry the, underwing ordnance? The Dash 4, which is this variation, uh, my other set of wings, this is my spare set, has uh, stations and it has eight 5 inch HVARs, which was a normal ordnance for this aircraft. So you had four and four under each wing. Then you had the pylons in the center. The standard configuration was all 50 caliber shells, eight 5-inch HVAR, which is high-velocity aircraft rockets. And then under the belly, the right was always a drop tank to carry you to destination to the target. And then in the other side would be either a 500-pounder or a 1,000-pound tiny Tim. And that would be a standard configuration for a Corsair for close air support. How effective was it in close air support? Extremely. In fact, all the ground guys, they were just, you know, they call in a strike and the Corsairs would come in and with all the five inch rockets and the bombs and the 50 caliber from each aircraft that was coming in, extremely effective, especially when the Koreans would be into a, 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 a hillside and they were had a cave. The Corsairs would come right down and shoot all those rockets straight in the cave and take out the bad guys so we can continue moving forward. Well, now, during the Second World War, actually, when it was designed, was it designed also to be a fighter and close air support? It was. It had a, a double role, if you will, because initially when it came out in its World War II, uh, I should say Pacific Theater, um, it was a fighter, strictly a fighter. And well, as it progressed, it became more of a close air support attack type mode. What was the kill ratio between the Corsair and the in the zeros. God. Make up something nobody knows. <laughs> <laughs> it was quite a bit. It actually was very effective. Yeah, very I, I effective. know it's effective. Yes. All right. Now, your particular paint job, of course, you've got Jim Tobel on the back, and you've got just, but what is the 416, and what does that designate? Well, you know, when we bought the aircraft, you don't know the history. And so Dad went up to the Naval Archives and did the uh, history search on the bureau number, 97143. And when he started to research it, he found that it was on the USS Boxer, on the carriers, USS Boxer, the USS Valley Forge, and the USS Riskini. So it was on three different aircraft carriers. And when it goes on a carrier, it's in a different squadron. And so some of them were painted differently. Some had H's on the tail, some had A's, some had the yellow uh, accents on it, some had blue, some had green. And so my dad started research the squadrons and found pilots that actually flew our airplane in combat. We got copies of their logbooks showing all the strafes and all the sorties they were going on with this exact airplane. So here we have the pilots that flew it in combat, and we have a true veteran, not well, knowing that, it. That's and neat. It that's is that, really neat. And unfortunately, all the pilots have passed. You know, age has caught up. But there is still one crew chief that actually, he was the crew chief on this exact airplane on the USS Valley Forge. And the skipper was Cook Cleland. Wow. You remember that yeah, name, oh, yeah, don't you? Oh, yeah, sure. Cook yeah, Cleland. Yeah. Well, now, you, now, you've flown a, a lot of different warbirds. How would you compare flying this to the different warbirds you've flown? Wow, that's interesting. Uh, my dad was my IP instructor pilot. And so he wrote my syllabus to get into this airplane to transition. And, you know, being a Marine, it wasn't going to be easy. And uh, so I had to follow exactly what he wrote. I did everything he said. And it became the day I had to fly it. And I got in there, and I'm just looking at this big, huge 14-foot propeller and this horsepower. And I was ready. And I go, Dad, I, I don't know about this. And he goes, son, it's easier to fly in the SNJ. And I'd look down at him and say, it's easy to say that down there. And uh, I had 1,500 hours in the T-6. You know, we've been friends a long time. Yeah. You know, I've been flying that. Yeah. So first time, get out there, and I'm on the runway, and we operate out of 3,600 feet, very small strip. And I told Dad, I'm not coming back here. I'm going to go to Barnwell. I've got 5,000-foot strip. 
I said, I'll learn to land it, do whatever I got to do, and then I'll come back. So I'll be back when I feel I'm ready. So off I go. And I had never brought it up to 2,800 RPM before because the practice is a tail up and then back down. So the first time I took it all the way up, I got up to 2,800 RPM, and I'm still pushing throttle, and it's still coming up, and just everything is going crazy with this engine. And before I know it, I looked outside, I'm already in the air. And so I'm in there trying to print the gear up, put the canopy crank, and pull power back, pull this back, do this, trim, 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 every time you do something. And it was a hellacious 25 seconds. And one, by the time I got it, I'm climbing, and all my work stopped. It was like, wow. <laughs> got through that. So then I brought around and went to Barnwall, set up for the landing, and I came in, and I'm ready for anything. I don't know what's going to happen. This is my first landing. And after that takeoff, I wasn't sure what to expect. So I came down, and the touched down on the mains, squatted on the tail, and that was it. I said, that's a fluke. Turn around, went through another 20-second uh, holacious thing and take off, come back around. Same thing. Wheels landed. Everything was just as easy as my dad said. But, I, of course, I couldn't believe him. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Sam. Folks, we're, a couple more items here. Wait a minute. Oh. Go ahead. Yeah, if uh, you were flying a Corsair and you met head-on with a P-51 same fuel conditions, same flight conditions, and went for each other's tail, who would win that dogfight? Better pilot. <laughs> <laughs> Remember, I fly with a P-51, and this is the topic of discussion every time. If you got into a dogfight, who's going to win? Of course, I have horsepower, so I have brute force. The Mustang has agility because it's light, sleek, but not as much horsepower. So you definitely got to get the advantage. And I'll shoot them down every time. <laughs> <laughs> this program is put on by the Warbirds of America. And I want to kind of stress something here. You don't have to be a Warbird owner to be a member of the Warbirds of America. Most of us aren't. Jim is on the, he's on the board of directors. And we would love to have your membership and kind of support us to keep these airplanes flying. And thank you, folks, for coming. Thank you, Jim. Appreciate it.